to introduce uh, Dr. Josie Lesage, Applied Ecologist for the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Thank you so much for being with us here, Dr. Lesage, and uh, I'm gonna let you take it away. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Thanks all for making time in your schedules to attend this, and I hope it's interesting and as fun for you as it is for me to um, talk about plants and community science. Um, before we get started, I want to throw a huge shout out to the Ventura County Agricultural Commissioner's Office, who um, was really fundamental in making this uh, possible. So big, big shout out to them um, for helping with this. All right. Um, I'm going to get started today, assuming that my slides progress, by introducing myself. Um, as Kendra mentioned, my name is Josie. I'm the Applied Ecologist at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Um, and I am trained as an ecologist, which means that I study the relationships between organisms and their environment and each other. Um, so basically, I really am interested in plants. Um, I'm interested in environmental restoration and environmental conservation. And I'm interested in how those theories, those ecological theories are applied to the landscape. Um, to help us manage and care for our local habitats. And as a part of this, I think it's really important to think not only about the organisms that are out there, but also the people who are interacting and who are a big part of our planet. So I'm also interested in community science and helping other people find ways to connect with and steward their local habitats. Um, I'm also a member or a staff member at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, so I'm going to plug them real quick. Um, this is what it looks like right now. It's gorgeous. If you haven't been, I highly recommend visiting. This is the best time of year to go. Um, the vista right as you enter is absolutely spectacular. Um, and besides the amazing vista, I think we have a pretty amazing mission, which reflects my own personal feelings about the environment. Um, the mission at the garden is to conserve California's native plants and habitats for the health and well being of people and the planet. Um, and so it's this recognition that all these things are interconnected, and that if we're going to preserve um, our local habitats, we also have to be thinking about the people who are in them and around them. Um, all right, with that plug aside, um, this is a really broad overview of what I'm going to cover today. We're gonna start with uh, some ecology and invasive species 101. For those of you who have recently taken a course on this, I'm sorry if there's any repetition. And for other folks, I hope that there's something new and interesting to learn. Um, we're gonna follow that up with a whirlwind introduction to iNaturalist and community science. Um, I'll show how cool iNaturalist is as a tool and how easy it is to add observations. And then the real uh, meat and potatoes of the presentation, we're going to talk about the key invasive species that you will find, particularly in the southern Los Padres, um, in the Ojai and Santa Barbara Ranger districts, primarily. So we'll get started. Ecology and Invasive Species 101. Um, so one of the big things that I think about a lot is why we should even care about plants. This is like the real entry level to why does this matter? Um, and the reason is that plants provide us with a number of valuable services. So our clean air and clean water are largely due to plants. Um, the fact that we have a lot of food and medicine, everything relies on plants as the base layer. The uh, plants hold on to soil nutrients and they retain soils. They increase slope stability, um, and they're really big carbon sinks. So above ground and below ground, plants are really important for climate re uh, regulation and resilience to disturbances. So things like fire, um, hurricanes, and other climates, plants are really important to having a resilient system um, that responds to those disturbances. And really, plants are the foundation of terrestrial ecosystems on planet Earth. Um, without plants having evolved to grow upright and survive on land, um, organisms, animals probably would never have made it onto land afterwards. So plants were really the pioneers that have made terrestrial ecosystems habitable to organisms like ourselves. And 
there are many of these ecosystems in the Los Padres. So there's a huge variety of plants, there's a huge variety of biodiversity period, um, but our ecosystems are really founded on what plants are present. So our shrubby ecosystems, our chaparral, um, our woodlands are defined by the types of trees they have in them, right? So whether it's an oak woodland or a conifer woodland, um, our grasslands, our coastal sage scrub, riparian corridors are all associated with specific plant communities uh, that form these ecosystems. And so this is really the, the foundation of ecology. What are these ecosystems? Um, and something that I think I at least didn't think about a lot until I really started studying ecology was that ecosystems include species that are both native and non-native. Um, so you've got a, a combination in all ecosystems. I cannot name for you a single ecosystem that is um, purely native or purely non-native. There's always a bit of a mix because uh, we've been really good at spreading organisms around. And so this might raise the question of what is the difference anyway between native, non-native and invasive species? And the way that I think of it and the way that I think is it's generally defined, there's some debate, which I'm happy to talk about at some point if anyone's interested. Um, native species are those that have evolved in an area. And so if you've got this like deep time concept, long term view of how an area developed and how evolution occurred, native species are the ones that have been there for quite some time and evolved in that habitat. Um, non native species then are those that arrive in a new place and did not evolve there in this sort of deep time context. Um, they're new to the area. So we've got our native tufted poppy um, versus rosemary, which is not native to our system, but grows quite well here because it's also from a Mediterranean system. Finally then, we'll have invasive species, which are specifically non-native plants or animals or really any species that are um, very good competitors and can rapidly outcompete the other species native to a system and cause ecological harm. So they might take up resources, um, they might not have predators, they're species that will grow and become abundant very quickly. And I just wanna emphasize that not all, no, not all non-native species are invasive. So there are plenty of non-native species that are perfectly fine to have in your gardens. Um, they're, you know, they're not going to escape, they're not going to run away, but there are others that will become invasive. And so um, there's a distinction there that I think sometimes gets lost. All right, so what makes a species invasive in the first place? And how do invasive species get around? Well, oftentimes invasive species are just better competitors. Um, they take up space, they compete for nutrients more effectively, they grow faster, they produce more seeds, or perhaps they arrive in an area and there's no natural predator uh, that can tackle them. Uh, so they, they're released from predation or they're released from some sort of competition. So this is an example of yellow star thistle, which if anyone's had to walk through this, you know it's not a fun time. Um, and they just, you can see that it's really, it's a great competitor and nothing is going to eat it because it's very pokey. Um, additionally, some invaders are really, really, really good at taking advantage of disturbance. So if there's a fire or a landslide or some event that disturbs the soil, invasive plants, because they can grow so quickly are often really good at responding to disturbance. Um, I study a lot of post-fire recovery, and there are a lot of invasive species that do really, really well after fire. Um, they just love the, it's, I mean, it's basically like a little nutrient deposit that happens in the soil and there's nothing to compete with initially. So they can really boom right after a fire. And they get around a lot because they can be transported by humans. Um, so if you've ever, used a boot brush and seen the amount of boots, uh, amount of soil that can cling to your boots, you know that humans are very good at carrying seeds of invasive species around. Um, if you've ever found little grass seeds in your socks, 
you know that we're very good at carrying um, species around. And so often a lot of the invasive species that we have um, in new areas have been transported by people intentionally sometimes, but also unintentionally. Um, and so invasive species, when they arrive and when they become dominant, are a major threat to biodiversity. Um, I'm going to start with these photos. So this is tamarisk in a southwestern riparian system. Um, it can easily form a monoculture. Uh, it can increase soil salinity by, um, it basically it loses water at a faster rate than a lot of native plants and that can lead to um, increased soil salinity. Uh, down below that, we've got Cape Ivy, which you may be familiar with if you've hiked in the Santa Barbara front country. There are some places where the Cape Ivy looks pretty much like this. It will just entirely cover um, a slope or it'll grow over other plants and it will actually starve other plants just by stealing all of the sunlight by growing on top of them. Um, and then this is a lovely video of California's golden rolling hills, uh, which are green for approximately, it feels like two hours in the spring before they turn brown, uh, particularly this year. But um, they're just these beautiful hills of mostly non-native grasses. So if you've ever been on a hike through a grassland, chances are that somewhere between 60 to 90% of what you were looking at is non-native annual grass from Eurasia. Um, so you can see in the background of this video, we've got a nice chaparral -y little, it looks like little broccolis growing on the hills. Um, that's our native chaparral. And very often it's been converted into grassland for a number of reasons, either um, grazing or fire or any number of disturbances. So uh, invasive species, once they get established can become really dominant and they'll push out native species and degrade habitat. Uh, and so I swear this is the only graph that I will show you. Um, so bear with me. Uh, on this graph, we're going to have the number of individual plants increasing over time. Uh, so time on the x-axis and the number of individual plants and also the cost of eradication. And so what that will look like is basically a big swoopy S curve. So early on, a plant will be introduced, uh, it'll arrive in an area, and it'll grow pretty slowly. It won't immediately take over. Um, and we might have some early detections. So if we have a wonderful complement of community scientists who are out there looking for this plant, maybe we'll be able to detect it early. And at that stage, you'll note that the cost of eradicating is still pretty low because it'll only be in one or two spots, there'll be small populations, and we'll have caught it at this prime moment. So that's sort of proactive management where eradication is feasible, it's doable, we have a great chance of preventing that species from spreading on the landscape. However, uh, the reality of what usually happens is that land managers um, aren't able to begin interventions until later on in the invasion curve. So basically, um, you know, due to funding constraints or due to just not noticing it or due to a million other things that are taking up time and effort, um, it might not get any actions until later on. And usually the public doesn't become aware until very late in the curve. Um, and so this is part of this presentation is part of the process of hoping that we can get the public aware back here instead of up here. Um, but once you've reached this point, you'll note that we go very quickly from relatively affordable to remove or eradicate to relatively expensive to remove or eradicate. And so at this point, you might think that uh, think of this as active management where eradication is still possible, but it's going to be really, really intensive. Um, and you've sort of missed the prime window of opportunity to do much. All right. So then this last part of the curve, which we hope we don't get into, but which some species are certainly in, excuse me, is the reactive management phase. And so in this phase, um, you're probably never going to be able to eradicate the species, right? We're probably never going to get rid of um, Eurasian grasses in California. 
but you might be able to protect key areas. So you might recognize places where um, you do targeted eradication for just a small area. And so one way to think of that is if you can't eradicate, you can still protect and restore in key pockets that are of high value because they provide um, habitat for rare species or they are extremely biodiverse. So there are some small pockets where even though fennel is kind of everywhere, maybe we still want to eradicate the fennel in that little pocket because we've got some beautiful or otherwise um, meaningful populations of organisms there. Um, and this slide is really just an excuse to show you all what beautiful flowers there are in the Los Padres. Um, jewel flower, fritillary, Lilium humboldtii, um, or humboldt lily. This is a little tiny mimulus. Um, Johnstonii, which forms these little pink carpets. And it's just adorable. It's like truly like a little pink carpet. Um, Monardella, Hypoluca, Hypoluca, which um, prior to about a year and a half ago was known from maybe, I want to say like 10 populations. And um, an amateur community scientist who was helping us with a project has now mapped at least 43 occurrences of this plant. Um, so pretty cool stuff. Uh, and then a bumblebee, because they're great. Uh, and so I know that I sometimes go quickly and I sometimes talk a lot. Uh, so I'd love to have question periods between the sort of sections of my talk. So I don't know, Kendra, if people can put questions um, in the chat generally. Yes. Or the if there are any. The chat box is open for questions. Are there any questions? I see a question about, is there a list of invasive plant uh, for specific regions of the Los Padres? Uh, that is a good question. I do not know of a specific regional list, um, but one thing you can do, and we'll talk about this uh, a bit later, um, one thing you could do is you could um, reach out to your local weed management area um, and find out through them their weed management areas for um, pretty much everywhere in the state of California. You can reach out to them um, and find out if they have any lists that are uh, more focused on your area, although it won't necessarily be Los Padres only. All right, other questions that I'm seeing. Da, da, da. Uh, can a non-native plant be used to wipe out current invasive plants? That's an interesting question. Um, I think if you've got another non-native plant that's just as good at competing with your invasive plant, that would make it also invasive. And so you might just be shifting from one invasive to another. Um, that's definitely something that has happened before where um, we'll see changes in the invasive plant that's dominant in an area. Um, and something that I've seen a lot is uh, erodium and grass competition. So um, non-native grasses will do really, really well in wet years, but erodium will do really, really well in drier years. Um, and so you'll see this sort of cyclical um, change from different invasives. Um, hopefully that answered that question. When did the wild oats get introduced to California? I am in Big Sur. Um, that's a great question. So there are a couple species of wild oat, uh, including, a, or they're all avenas, um, is the genus name for that group. Um, I, would, I would guess, this is me guessing, so please don't take this and tell everyone you know. Fact check me before you uh, send this out. Um, I would imagine with, uh, Spanish colonial settlers was when that grass came. Um, 
someone has mentioned that you can contact the staff botanist. Uh, yeah, the so the, the Los Padres does have botanists for the various regions, and they um, do have lists of focal invasive species um, and of native and rare plants. There's definitely a rare plant list for the Los Padres that you can look up fairly easily online just to Google. Uh, once invasive species are established, they stay there forever. Do they ever go away and can the habitat be restored to its original native flora? That's another good question. Um, so for some systems, yes, eradication is very possible um, even after a species established uh, is established. So if you're working in small areas or if you're working with a species that's particularly susceptible to a particular pesticide, um, you can usually manage them fairly well. Or if you've got a really great crew who's willing to do a lot of manual labor and weed for many, many years on end, um, you can eradicate them. So there are groups in Northern California who do boom, uh, broom bashes every weekend. They go pull up broom with a weed wrench. Um, so it can be done, definitely can be done. All right. I think that's it for questions here. So hopefully it was a fun whirlwind uh, intro to ecology. <laughs> See, one more question. How many hours of labor for pesticide use versus manual labor for effective removal? Varies a lot. Um, pesticides, uh, unfortunately, um, because they are, you know, they're chemicals and they can be very dangerous. Um, are way cheaper and way faster. Um, so there are definitely some downsides to pesticides, but they're actually a very effective means of eradicating some species. Not always, but sometimes. All right. With that, I'll transfer over to talking about community science and iNaturalist. Um, so how you can help us keep track of invasive plants essentially. So what is community or citizen science? Um, just a note that I use the term community science because I think it's a bit more inclusive. This has also been known as civic science or citizen science, um, but it's basically just science that's conducted all or in part by non-professional scientists. So people who you know, have day jobs doing other things, but who are interested in science and who are interested in collecting data um, and wanna be a part of the scientific process. Uh, and community science can involve all kinds of things. So it can involve the actual data collection. It can involve data processing. Um, so you can go online and you can help people who have um, like uh, motion, motion triggered cameras. Um, you can help them code their data. So you can say, oh, this was triggered by, you know, a skunk. This one was triggered by a bobcat. Um, that's a thing that community scientists can do. They can help with the analysis of data and they can help with advocacy and policy work. So um, taking the scientific data and bringing it to your legislator or to um, your local groups and organizations to advocate for changes in management. Um, and iNaturalist is a, I think, fantastic uh, community science platform for recording biodiversity data. So there are a lot of different types of community science projects and different types of data you can collect. But um, if you're recording uh, biodiversity data, I think INAT is a great um, platform to use for that. And so what is iNaturalist? Um, I think of it as social media for naturalists. Uh, I've been told by someone at the garden that they no longer use any Facebook, Instagram, or other social media but that INAT is their social media now. Um, it's a really cool way to share where you've been and what you're up to and what you're seeing. Uh, and it's really active. There are a lot of people on iNaturalist. So somewhere between 120 and um, 2,800 monthly users around the globe. Uh, I think this number might actually already be a million short compared to when I Put this slide together, I think we might be up to 70 million or something observations, um, just over half of which are research grade, which means that they are um, identified to uh, species or genus by at least two people. 
So um, they've been identified by experts or people who feel confident IDing organisms. Uh, every day, there's somewhere between 50 and 100,000 new observations, and it covers all biodiversity on Earth. Uh, so when I say all biodiversity, I do mean the macro stuff, but I also mean the micro stuff. So these are some examples of um, species that have been recorded on iNaturalist. We've got an American bullfrog, European starlings, and the yellow star thistle. Uh, and I think iNaturalist is underutilized to track invasive species. So um, a lot of people love posting their cute, you know, native plants that they're seeing, um, like that mimulus that I shared. People like to post the really nice, beautiful, you know, birds and plants they're seeing. But very rarely um, are people very enthusiastic about posting weeds. And so um, I think right now, iNaturalist is a bit underutilized for that, but is a very powerful tool to help us track invasive species. Uh, you can also put slime molds and mushrooms and all kinds of things on iNat. So it's a really cool, if you um, ever end up with like a weevil in your house and you want to know what kind of weevil it is, you can post it to iNat. Uh, and there are a lot of ways that you can engage with iNat. So you can go out and you can collect your own observations. Um, if you're someone who's got a bit of uh, identification experience under your belt, or you feel really confident, you know, telling one lizard from another, you can help on INAT by confirming IDs for other people. So you go through other uh, folks' uploads, you say, oh yeah, that looks like a horned lizard, or I think that might actually be a gecko. Um, and then another way to engage with INAT is that you can use the data. And so um, you can use data to planet management, uh, scientists use the data to answer research questions. Um, you can use the data to plan your next vacation. If you're going to Yosemite and there's like a species you really, really want to see, you can use INAT to figure out what trail you might want to hike to get a chance of seeing it. Uh, and you do these activities, some of them you do on the computer and some of them you'll want to do on your phone. So I have found that adding observations is easiest on your phone. Um, it's doable via the website. If you've got um, one of these cameras, I've got a really ancient DSLR. Uh, I sometimes upload through the website, but it's easiest through your iPhone or your uh, Android phone. Confirming uh, IDs for others and using the data, you should probably always do through the website. It's very, um, the apps are not really well built for those things. So I'm going to give a quick overview to what it's like to browse INAT on the web um, to sort of orient you. Um, I hope that you will make an account and sign in if you haven't already done so, but um, it's pretty straightforward. So once you make your account and you sign in, this is what your home page looks like. Um, you'll have an explore tab at the top, uh, a tab that will take you to view all of your observations, a tab that will include projects that you've joined, the forum, and the list of users. Uh, a tab for identify, which will help you um, figure out what plants or organisms you want to identify. I always say plants because I'm a plant person, but organisms that you want to identify. You will click the identify tab and that'll take you into a menu so that you can help people identify their observations. And then more includes a bunch of really cool stats pages, uh, tutorial videos that are super helpful, FAQs, and um, really just a bunch more that you might want to look at. And so at this point, um, I will reshare my screen to do a live demo of how cool INAT actually is. All right, so we are now looking at all of the observations in the Los Padres National Forest that have been added to iNaturalist. Um, and Kendra, maybe you want to be my guinea pig and tell me about a species um, or a group of species that you are interested in. It can be anything. Sure thing. Um, I'm really interested in the uh, lupins I've been seeing photos of recently um, and where those might be. A great pick. All right, so we're gonna um, 
We're going to look up Lupinus. If you don't know a genus name, that's okay. You can type lupins and it'll still um, pop up with lupins. So we're going to look at Lupinus. We can see there are something like 1,400 observations for 30 different species, um, with 514 people having seen those. Um, and so this is basically the map of where they are. Uh, you can see they stretch all the way up and down. Um, they're all throughout California. And as you zoom in, you'll see these points will show up mostly along trails and roads because that's where most people are. Although occasionally you'll see some off trail uh, observations from folks who like bushwhacking. Um, so you can zoom in and learn about any of these lupins. So you can see there are a bunch up here in the Santa Barbara backcountry, a lot of lupins here. Um, you can really just zoom in anywhere and find out what there is. What's really cool is if you click on the species tab, you can look at all the different species that have been seen. So we've got silver lupin, stinging lupin, sky lupin, chick lupin, so forth and so on. Um, and if you click on observations, you can open them in a new tab and look at just the lupinus macrocarp or microcarpus. Uh, so this is a really powerful tool to learn about what's in your area, to get a sense of what's going on. Um, if you're going to go somewhere, uh, let's say you wanted to hang out back here on the San Inez River and you were really interested in whether um, anyone had seen certain manzanitas, you could just look up Arctostaphylos and check out what Arctostaphylos have popped up there. I will say Arctostaphylos is a really hard thing to ID, so there will not be a lot of research grade observations of that. Um, I saw a question pop up in chat, and it's a really great one, um, and one that is definitely worth spending some time talking about. Are you ever concerned about advertising where rare plants are and how that affects native plant populations? Certainly, yes. Um, so iNaturalist has, you might see out here, there are all these sort of um, dots instead of um, points. Maybe a little difficult to see. Let's zoom in a little bit. So it'll be a dot instead of a, a sort of teardrop, an upside down teardrop. And that happens either when someone has obscured their coordinates or uh, automatically if the organism is a rare species. So um, I'm going to open up my observations real quick because I saw one of these guys the other day. So this is the Blainville's horned lizard. He's a real cutie and he's listed as vulnerable um, by one or another organization. So it could be a CNPS listed plant. It could be um, a species that's federally listed. But if it's been marked on iNaturalist and they, they keep it pretty up to date, if it's been marked on iNaturalist as being threatened or vulnerable in any way, um, you'll notice that the population bubbles are not actually geolocated. They'll just be a, a random point somewhere within the quad um, within that area. And so that's one layer of protection. So you can safely INAT rare plants to show um, where it's been. And that data won't be publicly available, but you might get a request from a researcher at some point who says, oh, wow, you found this really interesting rare plant. Could you share the location information with me? Um, so in doing so, um, you're protecting where that plant is exactly, but potentially still providing information that will be valuable to researchers down the line or giving them an access way to you if they're curious about where um, a particular organism was found. Uh, and I can actually show you that Monardella hypoluca hypoluca. So this is a rare plant, which um, we've added a lot of points recently. Uh, and you can see that they're all sort of scattered here um, in the Santa Barbara and in the Ojai area to some degree. Uh, so that's how the explore page works. You could also filter to um, just, if you were interested in snakes or reptiles, you could filter it to just reptiles and see what's been found in terms of reptiles in Los Padres. Um, there's our cute little horned lizard friend again. 
rattlesnakes. Um, so there's a lot of ways to filter. You could look for introduced reptiles. So we've got our slider turtle. Uh, introduced reptiles is going to include our American bullfrog friend. Um, so you can you can filter in a lot of really interesting ways to get a sense of what's out there. Uh, and I, I think it's a really great tool to learn about what's in your region, um, not only by posting observations that you make, but also just by browsing around on here. All right, so that was the demo. Um, any other questions about this explore page? Is there an offline mode? I wish there was an offline mode. There is not. Um, you need to be connected to the internet in order to do this kind of searching. It'd be real cool if you didn't need to do that though. All right, back to our PowerPoint. So when you upload to INET, it tracks a lot of data. Um, a lot of this is collected automatically. As long as you have your permissions set, it'll ask you when you first install the app, you know, is it okay for us to collect your location data? You should say yes, because that's a big part of the value of INAT. Um, it'll record the date and time at which you're making the observation. It'll record um, species information. If you have a sense of what the species is, it'll record any images or sounds that you add. So. If you are a birder and you hear a new bird song, you can actually record that and add it to INET and hopefully someone will be able to tell you what it is um, and much more. It can also keep track of things like the phenology of the organism or um, what life stage it's in. So is it flowering? Is it fruiting? Um, it can track sex if you're dealing with animals or some plants. Um, so it, can, it, it records a lot of information. Uh, and so we kind of saw this, but what does an observation look like then? Well, this is basically what an observation page looks like. It'll have a couple key pieces of information. Um, so to orient you over here, we'll have the observation day and time and when it was submitted um, to the website. So if you've got old photos that you know roughly where they are and you kind of want to know what was in that photo, you can, uh, you can upload them um, years after the fact. There are definitely folks on INET who are uploading pictures from you know, 2017 or 2010, where they're just like, I really wanna know what that is. Um, it'll include spatial data. So you'll have this little box. Um, again, if you have a rare plant or a rare organism, um, this little pin icon will be an eyeball to show that it's obscured. Uh, it'll include any identifying media that you've added. So any photos or video or um, actually I don't think they support video, any photos or sounds that you've added. And then there will be a list of identifications. So um, you can add an identification, someone else can add an identification, but those will all be listed under the media. Um, and people might disagree. And so when people disagree, you'll reach this community taxon, which is sort of what is the highest up the evolutionary tree that people can agree this photo um, is. So in this case, two people agree that this is Eurospermum picroides, um, but that's not always the case. Maybe someone else would think, actually, I think this is Sonchus, and it might just be uh, Asteraceae. So the community taxon is the lowest um, down the evolutionary tree you can get that people will agree something is. All right. Making an observation is super duper easy. Um, so if you've got a smartphone, um, this is how it works. You just open up the app, you'll add a couple photos, you'll add the species ID or leave it blank, you'll, um, and the date, time, and location info should all be added up automatically. Uh, I'm gonna show a one minute video that will do exactly this. The method is really similar for iPhones and Androids. So you would tap observe, you'll hit camera. This is me taking a photo of fennel uh, at Ealings Park in Santa Barbara. I hit use photo. Um, something that I will talk about later is the value of adding multiple photos of an organism. Um, when you have the chance, multiple angles can be really valuable. So here I've got another photo um, of the base of the plant and I'll take one more of the fruits just in case. 
Uh, it also helps to take photos that are in focus. So now that I've added my three photos, I will um, add a species or I'll suggest a species for what I think this is. Um, if you're connected to the internet, iNaturalist will populate a list of species that it thinks look similar, uh, but you can always type it in yourself. If you are not entirely sure what the thing is, you can always just type plants. Uh, if you find something particularly strange and you're not even sure that it's a plant or you're like, maybe this is a fungus, maybe it's an algae, you can always put state of matter life uh, and other people can weigh in on what type of life it is. So you can go really broad or really narrow. You could say, I just think it's a lupin, or if you know what kind of lupin it is, or you could say, I think it's in the pea family. Um, anywhere in the evolutionary tree, you can label your plants or animals. Um, I also want to point out this geo privacy thing. So um, if you are taking observations in your backyard, which I do a lot of, um, I love watching the bees on the plants in my backyard, you can set the geo privacy to obscured. And again, that'll um, hide the exact coordinates and instead just put a dot somewhere in the map nearby. Um, and captive or cultivated, this is another important thing to know about. If you're taking observations of something that's planted in a park, or that has obviously been put there by a human um, or someone's pet dog, uh, make sure that you mark it as captive or cultivated. Uh, I see another question in the chat about um, showing some examples. I will do that once I have finished talking about uh, uploading observations. So on the website then, um, nice big green button that says upload, that's where you'll do your uploading. You could also hit the plus um, add observations button here. And then you'll just upload photos from uh, wherever you've got them stored on your hard drive or on your computer. And so here we've just uploaded a photo. Well, um, a lot of times the metadata from the photo of when and um, if you've got a camera that has GPS coordinates where it was taken, um, you'll add that information if it's not already added automatically. And then you'll submit. Um, if you have a sense of what species it is, in this case, I think these were just beetles, so I put Coleoptera for beetles. Um, you'll just hit submit after you've entered what you want to enter. Um, so let me swap back to INAT real quick and demo um, invasive plants. Yeah, so. When you're looking, um, oh, and I'll actually show you guys, I didn't show you how this works. So I'll just do this. We'll start with the explore page, the raw explore page. This is what it looks like when you load up the explore page. If you go to filters and then more filters, you'll set the place to Los Padres. Um, you can also, there are a lot of places, if you have a local park that you're interested in, if you have um, your county that you want to look at, you'll just type that into place and a pop up should appear. Um, for introduce plants, you'll want to type or not type, you'll want to click this little introduce button. And then this little leaf is for plants. And then you'll hit update search. And it will show all of the introduced plants in the Los Padres, a whole 363 species. Um, when they say introduce plants, what they mean is in uh, non-native, not necessarily invasive. So this is where um, some of these are far more invasive than others. Some of these uh, non-natives are really not too big of a, a deal and other ones are really problematic. But um, this will give you a list of all the invasive or all the uh, non-natives that are present. Hopefully that was helpful. All right. So tips for collecting high quality data. If you're going to go out there and you're going to use your smartphone and collect some data, um, we have a few requests. Adding multiple photos is really, really helpful. Um, different angles. If you're doing plants, different parts of the plants. If you've got a flower and a leaf, take a photo of both. Um, a lot of times it's really helpful to have a habitat photo. So what does the organism look like in the context of the habitat? Um, you know, is this obviously in a stream? Is this obviously on a rocky slope? 
that can be really helpful. Uh, and take info in focus photos. So these are two of my photos. Uh, this is a bee that is never going to get identified beyond it's a bee. And this is a bee that we know is a Bombus phosmosinskii or a yellow faced bumblebee because it's in focus and it's at the right angle to show the stripe on the butt and the yellow face. Um, so in focus photos are really, really helpful. This one just got a bunch of question marks from the bee expert who IDs things on INET. Um, again, mark any captive or cultivated organisms appropriately when you upload them. Um, this is really helpful because it helps uh, researchers um, keep track of organisms. And it also helps us with the invasive plants because if there's um, an invasive that's captive in like a you know community park, that's very different from an invasive that you found 12 miles into the back country. Uh, all right, don't forget to upload when you get home. Um, something that's very easy to do is to take all these cool observations and then you get home and you forget to upload. Um, but it's pretty easy to do. You just reopen the app and you'll hit the sync button that shows up. And um, just to reiterate, in case it's not clear, I know I talk about plants a lot, but you can use iNaturalist to look at both native and invasive organisms, um, native and non-native organisms. And you can use it for more than just plants. So if you have a cooperative organism that's sitting still and lets you take a photo of it, you can upload that as well. And so again, before we move on to section three, if there are any questions or other things people would like me to talk about, happy to take the time to talk about that. It's also a good time to do a stretch break. I got my second vaccine shot yesterday. My arm is extremely sore, folks. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna assume since there are no questions in chat um, that we can barrel on ahead. Everybody's ready to Oh, uh, it should just be inaturalist.org. Kendra, do you mind putting the link in chat? Yes, I will do that. Thank you. All right. Um, everybody buckle in. We're going in for the plant ID stuff. We're gonna talk about who the invaders are in the Southern Los Padres and how to recognize them. So, Key species, key invasive species in the Los Padres, and again, primarily in the Santa Barbara and Ojai Ranger districts. Our first friend is going to be onion weed. Um, something I want to mention to everyone is that um, the big book of plant identification that most folks use in California is the Jepson Manual. And in the first couple pages of the Jepson Manual, it says that you um, in order to pronounce a Latin name properly, you have to say it with confidence. So it doesn't really matter how you pronounce it as long as you say it with confidence. That's the key to Latin names. So this is Asphodelus fistulosus uh, or onion weed. Uh, the way to recognize it is that it has these really distinct white flowers with the orange lines on them. Uh, the onion like leaves, when it's in fruit, the fruits look like small balls. Um, it is quite pretty. It can really, really cover an area. So this one you'll find often along roadsides or in disturbed soil places. Um, and it can just become a carpet. It really can outcompete all kinds of things. And because it's a bulb, it can be quite difficult to get rid of because it'll just pop back up from that bulb every year. Uh, so there are a couple places that you'll find it in the Southern Los Padres. Um, there's definitely a population off of uh, 150. There's um, some going up towards, I think this is Cozy Dell, uh, 154, and then along West Camino Cielo. Where is it from? That's a great question. If I had to make a guess, I would say Eurasia, but Google is probably a better um, answer than I will be on that. Um, most of the weeds that we find in our area are um, either from 
Eurasia, South Africa, or Australia. So they're basically plants from other Mediterranean habitats. Um, so either one of those is a good guess if you're not sure, like me in this moment. All right. Uh, pepperweed, Lepidium. This is an interesting one. Um, they're all interesting to me, so I'm going to say that for every single one. But it has white flowers. Um, photos of the fruits are key if you want to determine exactly what species it is. Uh, that's why we've just sort of said Lepidium instead of giving you the specific species. Um, Lepidium latifolium, which is this one in the bottom photo, tends to grow in wetter places along creeks and seeps. And uh, three other species, Lepidium drava, Lepidium Apelionum and Lepidium chalapens uh, are all found on disturbed soils usually, uh, although they can just be sort of in open um, soily areas as you can see here. Uh, again, this is a plant that can take over and just dominate an area. There are a couple spots that we have seen uh, Lepidiums in um, the Southern Los Padres. So they're sort of scattered populations, um, particularly in the Thomas fire scar, I've seen it popping up uh, on roads pretty far away from where the gates are. So pretty far into the back country. Um, and it's a good one to keep an eye on because as you can see from this photo, it can kind of spread out quickly and take up a lot of space. All right, our next species are tamarisk. Um, tamarisk can be quite beautiful. Uh, there was a period where these were used as a horticultural plant. They have these um, kind of gorgeous pink blooms when they're in full bloom. Um, and then they look kind of nondescript and scraggly when they're not happy and they're not in full bloom. Um, you will find them near water. So um, they're found along wet places, along rivers. Um, I've heard that there's a pretty bad population back behind Matillaha Dam where there used to be. Um, and I've seen them pop up in the front country in Santa Barbara uh, as well. So, um, and along the San Inez River, I think is the other place they're found. So there are a couple places. If you see this one, please make an observation for it or just email me or something. Um, this is a particular pet peeve of mine, tamarisk. So I'd like to know where it is. Uh, our next friend or frenemy maybe is Dalmatian toad flax. Uh, it has this very upright stem, these interesting kind of overlapping opposite leaves, um, very geometric looking. And then these kind of cute uh, yellow flowers. Uh, only known from Fraser Mountain and the nearby Hungry Valley um, vehicle recreation area. And so this is one that um, is of particular interest to see whether it's actually more widespread than we know. Um, it's only known from a couple spots. And so it's entirely possible that it's actually um, more established in a variety of places, but we just haven't recorded it yet. So. These are all um, all species that are still somewhat in that early stage of maybe they're actually still within the eradication window. Um, I see a question in chat. Would it do more harm than good if we tried to remove these species ourselves? Uh, I will answer that after I have gone through all the species. It's a good question. All right, Spanish broom. If you've ever driven up Highway uh, 33, you're familiar with this plant. Um, it's a large shrub. It has bright yellow flowers. It smells fantastic when it's in bloom, um, but it's pretty gnarly. It can really dominate an area. Um, I've seen it getting into some creeks, um, and it's closely related to some of the other brooms that are a particular problem in Northern California. So if you know a French broom or Scotch broom, uh, this is that this is in the same sort of cluster of species brooms um, that are all in the pea family that their seeds can last 30 years in the soil seed bank 
So once they become established, you're looking at at least 30 years of um, weed wrenching, basically, to get rid of them. Uh, so this is pretty well established along Highway 33 um, and to some degree along uh, the 154. If you encounter it in other places, um, please make an observation for it. So I've seen it um, back behind near Jameson Lake. There's some along the creeks there. Um, if you see it in places that, you know, there's not a large population, if you're finding only one or two plants of it, uh, make a note because um, we'd like to restrict it to just where it is. We don't want to see it crawling up uh, trails. So this is Howard Creek Trail um, near Rose Valley. And you can see it's starting to climb up along the trail. All right, skeleton weed. Um, another cool plant, another interesting plant, uh, kind of a generic daisy-ish looking yellow flower. But what makes it interesting is that the flowers are all along the stem. So they grow in these little nodes along the stem. Um, and so if you find a, a weird looking plant where there are a bunch of flowers halfway or you know scattered along the stem, it's, it might be skeleton weed. Um, when it's not in flower, it kind of looks like this nondescript scraggly, scraggly looking bush. It's just sort of a, a pile of stems. Um, this is another one that I think there are a couple populations back along Paradise Road. Um, it's also been seen in Carpinteria, I believe, um, and maybe in Thousand Oaks. So there, there are a couple scattered populations from place to place. Uh, and it's another one that's still in that really early stage. And if we catch it, we might have a chance of preventing it from spreading. Um, it's hard with these asters because their seeds often blow with the wind. And so they can pop up pretty far from where they were originally. And John brings up that they just found plants at the Santa Barbara train station. People bringing in plants on the train, y'all. All right, this is our section for the thistles and knapweeds. Um, I've sort of lumped these together because they're all purple and they're all in the same um, sort of category of thistles, uh, even though these two don't have spines necessarily. Uh, so our first one, Centaria maculosa, spotted knapweed. Um, I think it's beautiful, unfortunately invasive. It uh, has these pink flowers, um, very unique looking. The leaves are um, highly branched. I think of them as kind of being feathery. Um, and there's only a handful of populations known right now. So uh, Reyes Peak, Rose Valley, and East Camino Cielo are the only populations that I know of. Um, a cool thing about this one is that I was talking to someone from the Forest Service about this plant. They had just found a population um, on East Camino Cielo. And I was like, oh, I think I just saw a community scientist post that one. And the community scientist beat the Forest Service knowing about it by about six days, um, which is kind of cool to me, right? Like that's, that's really a sign that uh, you going out there and collecting data has the potential to inform us of things sooner. Uh, six days isn't that much, but it could be months, right? Um, so the data you collect is valuable, and it is great to have people out there looking for some of these weeds. All right. Our next knapweed is Russian knapweed. Um, also pink flowers, very similar looking, but the leaves are, uh, I think of them as chunky, and they're usually in a basil rosette right at the ground. So um, they'll form this nice uh, low down basil rosette. Pretty uncommon. I think that's only known from Sespe Creek for the time being. Um, the Forest Service, I will say, is also treating some of these populations. So, excuse me, the spotted knapweed that we were just looking at and this Russian knapweed have both been treated um, either the old fashioned way with shovels um, and maybe in the future starting with pesticides, but um, mostly the old fashioned way. Um, and so hopefully you won't see it, but if you do, let us know. Let the world know on iNaturalist. Uh, and then our last friend is 
purple star thistle, Centauria calcitrapa. Um, it's very spiny, as you can see. It looks pretty sharp, looks just as unpleasant as a uh, yellow star thistle. Um, right now, there are no INET records um, of this plant in the, in the southern Los Padres. Um, there are some Calflora records near Kachuma Camp, um, and I know that it has also been seen in San Luis Obispo and Thousand Oaks. Um, I think it's also a problem um, further north. So as with all of these, uh, keep an eye out. All right, and then our last set of species are gonna be our challenge mode species, which are the grasses. Um, I say that these are the challenge mode species because grasses are hard, even if you're a trained botanist. Um, to identify. There's a lot of little parts and a whole different language to understanding these. So our first grass that we're going to talk about is Medusa head, has these very long awns. Um, I'll also give you a quick overview of grass anatomy. So grasses have leaves, but the um, these are the flowers. I'm just going to leave it at that. These are the flowers of grasses. Um, let me go back, actually. These are grass flowers. These are grass seeds. They used to be flowers, flowers, uh, and I don't think there's any flowers visible on the arundo. But so grasses have highly modified flowers, uh, and that's part of what makes IDing them kind of tricky. So it has these very long awns on the flowers, uh, and you could probably take a guess as to why it is called Medusa head. Um, you know, hair growing out like crazy, uh, and I have seen this along Highway 33 on the way towards Sespe. Um, it might be found further along the road there. Uh, I have only seen it here, but if you see this one, I'd love to know where else it's found, and I'm sure the Forest Service would as well. Um, this is another one that can form dense monocultures and be really problematic. It's very difficult to remove once it becomes established. All right, uh, our next grass is perennial belt grass, Erharta calicina. Um, this is probably the most difficult one to ID, I think. Doesn't have any clear giveaways um, if you're new to grasses. So it's got this reddish hue, and oftentimes the leaf blade will be wrinkled, and there will be this kind of wrinkled, funny attachment where the leaf connects to um, the sheath. Uh, or there will be these little hairs there as well. And so if you're looking up close, if you are observing a grass that you think might be Erharta or really any grass, um, it's really helpful to take good close-up photos of where the leaf attaches to the sheath. Um, if you have a ruler out with you in the field, I know you probably won't, but it can be helpful. Uh, I believe this one has only been seen along West Camino Cielo, and there are currently no INAT points for it, but it has been found along Highway 154. All right, our second to last grass is going to be Arundo or Giant Reed. Um, the name says it all, it really is giant. You can see in this photo, the leaves are like the width of your whole hand. Um, it can look like these giant corn stalks growing in the middle of a river. It grows clonally. If um, just a piece of the, the root washes downstream, it'll establish somewhere else, it can be kind of problematic. Um, so it's found in usually near water and in creeks and rivers. Um, and there are large populations along the Santa Clara and Ventura River, um, as well as some in Matillaha Creek and uh, it's also at um, the top of Hot Springs Trail, if you hike all the way back at Hot Springs Trail um, in Santa Barbara. Uh, and I think there's also some on Cold Springs now too. All right. Our last grass is pampas grass. Um, you might have seen this in somebody's like wedding centerpiece. Uh, it's sometimes planted as an ornamental. It looks very... Um, it's just an exciting, I don't know, it's a very fun plant. 
Um, it's very showy, these big tufts of flowers uh, stand really high above it, um, but it escapes easily into wildlands. So this one's a huge problem along the North Coast. Um, I did my PhD at uh, UC Santa Cruz, and if you're driving anywhere along the North Coast, you're probably going to see this um, all the way up Highway 1 from Santa Cruz to San Francisco, it's just everywhere up there. Um, and I imagine it's probably also a problem along Big Sur. Um, it's been seen in the Santa Barbara and Montecito front country, but nowhere else, and we hope it stays that way. But if you do see it, make an observation. Um, and with that, I can take questions. And I will start with, um, would it do more harm than good if we tried to remove these species ourselves? Um, in my official capacity, I will say that you probably shouldn't do any land management without the official permission of the land manager. Um, there, and also, unless you're 150% sure that you know what the plant is. Um, and also that you know for sure that the way you'd be removing it is an effective means of removal. Um, there are times when you might pull something out um, and it can reroute really easily. And so if you pull it out, in effect, what you've done is you've now created two because the thing you've tossed aside will reroute and the thing that was left in the ground will reroute. Um, that said, um, there are opportunities out there to do weed removal, um, and you can definitely find out about them um, by connecting with your local weed management area or by, you know, talking to the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden or any, any local orgs. We're doing um, a project in the near future dealing with some of the Spanish broom on East Camino Cielo. Um, and so we're looking for volunteers to help us help us with seed collection for that project. Uh, all right, uh, other questions. Do you know how long their seed are viable? Referring to the Scotch broom, French broom. Um, so Scotch broom and French broom, I have seen um, documents saying that their seeds are viable in the soil for 30 years, um, maybe more, maybe less, depending on conditions. But 30 years, I think the standard number that I've seen. So um, they they can germinate up to 30 years after they were dropped from the plant. Um, meaning that if you eradicate the above ground material, you'll probably have seedlings popping up for a considerable amount of time. Uh, so I imagine that in the future, after we do this treatment on East Camino Cielo, we will be looking for folks to help us with um, fairly regular annual weed whacking of the broom that we um, that pops up from where we removed it. Um, for other species like the thistles and the pampas grass, I don't know a number offhand. Um, some, some plants, um, a lot of grasses have seeds that don't last very long. Um, I know that tamarisk has seeds that are only viable for like a year, if that. Um, they basically, you know, land and they have to germinate right away or they'll die. Um, but I'm not sure about some of the other plants. Any other questions? Are there invasive plants that were successfully removed uh, and continue observation in the area to monitor. Um, if I'm understanding this question correctly, um, there are places where there has been successful eradication of some plants. Um, and of course I am blanking and cannot come up with anything. Um, I think that they have successfully eradicated some invasive plants from the Channel Islands. It's a lot easier when you're on an island um, because you have a bit more you know, constraint around where you're working. Um, I think there are a couple parks in Northern California where they successfully have been knocking back broom. Um, 
especially if you look at the sheer quantity of broom that there used to be to what there is now. Um, so that's there. Do you have a call to arms email list of volunteers when you have a special eradication project? Not yet, but I'm hoping that this is something we will continue to develop. Um, definitely reach out about the Spanish broom um, restoration and removal project. Um, we're looking for folks to help us with seed collection for now, but I know that we will definitely want some help um, with weed whacking eventually. And I also have a project um, starting in the fall of this year um, near Piru, which is going to be a, a restoration project where we will also be doing some, likely some manual weed, uh, weed removal. Uh, does anyone know effective methods for star thistle removal? I don't know of any particular, they're, they're, it's a hard one to get rid of. Um, I have seen uh, success with combinations of things where you've got, um, you know, grazing at the right moment and then the biological control. So there are weevils that have been released that are, um, good at uh, at least knocking back some of the yellow star thistle, but I cannot off the top of my head think of any super successful examples. Ooh, mowing at 5% plus biological control. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, John, do you want to elaborate? If I had to take a guess that that, mean, that means that they're mowing annually um, before the star thistle sets seed and they have biological, uh, biological control agents, so probably a weevil species in the area. Um, the weevils burrow into the seeds or their, their larvae burrow into the seeds, um, which prevents them from being able to germinate because they get eaten. All right, in that case, I just want to say a huge thank you to the LPFA for having me, um, to Ventura County Agricultural Commissioner's Office, uh, to the U.S. Forest Service um, for letting me traipse around their land and look at all the plants they've got, and particularly to all of the community scientists who've helped us so far for a bunch of different projects, um, mapping and looking through data and helping us ID things online. So thank you so much to all of you for coming here and watching this. Um, and please feel welcome at any point if you have any questions or want to learn more about our Spanish broom seed collection, um, not Spanish broom seed, co seed collection to replace the Spanish broom with native plants, how about that? Um, please feel welcome to email me. Um, and if you want to learn more about the invasive plants um, in your area, I'd be happy to talk to you if you're not in the Southern Los Padres about who you might connect with in the region that you're in. Thank you so much, Josie, for being here tonight. I learned so much and I'm so thrilled um, to have this knowledge. I feel much more prepared now when I got into the forest to be looking for plants. And I hope um, that other plant enthusiasts um, are too. And I just wanna put out another plug. If you are interested in volunteering with the LPFA to be doing this kind of work, um, in partnership with the Botanic Garden, please uh, shoot us an email. I put it in the chat, but it's volunteer at lpforest.org. And uh, we'd love to have you and create, um, you know, a, a dedicated uh, invasive plant crew on our uh, volunteer group. So thank you again, everybody for being here tonight and uh, have an enjoyable Earth Day tomorrow. <laughs> Bye everybody, take care. Hi folks, thank you.